All right, it's Thursday, May 19th. This is episode 216 of the Token CEO Podcast. I'm Erica Nardini, and I'm the CEO of Barstool Sports. Um, you can subscribe to Token CEO on YouTube. You can buy the business casual sweatshirt. We actually have a whole bunch of awesome merch at store.barstoolsports.com. And then, as always, if you can support our ad partners included in this episode, we always appreciate it. The advertisers keep us going. Um, we are doing three things today. We have an awesome interview with Virginia Krieger. You may know her daughter, Tiffany, because she was a finalist on American Idol and she was poisoned by a fentanyl pill. And we hear from Virginia, who's her mom, about her quest to make people more aware of what is happening with the new war on drugs. We also have the boardroom, so we'll give a quick update on what's happening here. We do Q&A as always, and then we'll let you out of this episode. All right, so the big thing happening at Barstool is that we have Rough and Rowdy tomorrow night. So live from Wheeling, West Virginia, we have Dan and Dave, Roan, Kayla, Robbie, the whole crew is down in Wheeling. We're doing Rough and Rowdy a little bit different. We have a new producer and a promoter working with us. Devlin has been producing this show nearly by himself, so we're excited to see what happens. Tom Mullins, one of the most talented editors of all time, is also on it. One of the best things about doing Rough and Rowdy in West Virginia is that you just get the best characters. And, you know, starting from when Dave went originally, but certainly in the last six years of us doing it, you know, you would find the guys like coming straight in from the coal mine and they've got their dirty boots and then they're like going into the the ring to fight like West Virginia is just a certain there's just a certain atmosphere that a weirdness a wackiness a wildness and then there's also this tinge of sadness around what's happening in West Virginia in particular around drug addict drug addiction so fired up for rough and rowdy excited for everybody to listen to it should be a great show we're excited to see how the next iteration of rough and rowdy goes um, I think it's some of the best live programming and live events that we do we were at the DAZN fight Two weekends ago, we did the Canelo fight. I thought Dave and Dan did an incredible job. I thought large was literally larger in, than life. Um, but one of the things we saw was like, we were awesome from a promotional perspective for DAZN. I think we generated a huge amount of hype, a huge amount of interest. We struggled with them on the executional. Like it was tough. There was a lot of problems technically. We couldn't cover the guys the way we wanted to. We flew Caleb and Roan down there and you know how they made make things just incredible and we weren't really ever able to get a camera on them. From an advertising and partnership perspective, it was awesome. I think from a content perspective, showcasing what we can do around a live event, that was incredible. And then obviously if we do this again, we've got to figure out a way to cover us the way we like to be covered. So that will be covered in West Virginia. But the other thing happening in West Virginia right now, which is why we wanted to tie this to Virginia, is that the drug crisis in West Virginia is off the chart. So I was reading an article. I was reading, I kind of fell into like a whole quagmire of content on this. So West Virginia, what's really sad about what's happening in the drug crisis in West Virginia, which isn't unique only to West Virginia, this is essentially, this is ravaging rural America, is that the opioid crisis is creating a needle sharing crisis, which is leading to a massive, massive outbreak of AIDS. So, so West Virginia, I think, has a higher daily rate of AIDS contraction than New York City. So like, think about the size of New York City and think about the size of Charleston, West Virginia. Like West, Charleston, West Virginia probably has like 156,000 people. New York, just Manhattan, probably has 4 million people plus. There's more people contracting AIDS in West Virginia because of needle sharing and drug addiction than New York City. Like that's awful. So the other thing that's really controversial about this is that needle sharing programs, which have largely been thought to be the best way to fight contraction of hepatitis C or AIDS because the addicts are able to turn in needles versus sharing them and reusing them. Those programs have been deemed illegal, are being threatened to be shut down in the state of West Virginia. And the reason they're being shut down is for lack of tracking. And then there's kind of this perception that if you enable drug use, you're contributing to the drug crisis. But 
What I found really interesting in talking to Virginia at large is that the drug crisis in this country has changed. Like when I was a kid, it was like the Nancy Reagan. When Nancy Reagan was the first lady, there was a huge anti-drug crusade, like dare, dare to keep your kids off drugs, like all that kind of stuff. But when you think about the war on drugs at that time, like was very much about seeking criminals and incarcerating criminals or drug traffickers, minor drug traffickers, local drug traffickers. Since then, the drug crisis, quote unquote, has exploded. It's become so much more sophisticated. It's marketed in a way that it never has been before. The ability for drugs to run from China to Mexico to this country is, is nearly perfected, and it's impossible to keep up with. But the fight of it has morphed into meeting people where they are and kind of the creation of this whole philosophy on meeting people where they are versus penalizing or punishing or incarcerating people by, by virtue of what they've done, which I, th I felt like was really interesting. The other thing that I think is really interesting is how drugs are being marketed right now on social media. So if, like, if you have time or you go into your Apple News and you Google like social media networks, drug promotion, one of the things that's happening is that because so much content right now is disposable and because so many operations understand how to be viral, and the very nature of like hashtags and tagging itself is you can produce a lot of content that promotes drug use, promotes drug acquisition, promotes buying drugs, and then it disappears. So it's virtually untraceable. So on this point, an NBC News investigation found that Snapchat was linked to the sale of fentanyl-laced pills that killed teenagers and young adults over a, dozen uh, over a dozen states. So Snapchat in particular has been, uh, has been accused of helping to promote illicit drugs and helping to contribute to fentanyl deaths in particular. One of the things that Snapchat has said is that they're combating this. So they're making it harder to add friends to your network and they're adding more resources uh, and more, they're adding more resources and more focus to drug education. So we'll see if that works or not. The crazy thing on fentanyl, fentanyl fatalities rose more than 93,000 in 2020. That's a 32% increase from 2019. The hardest group of people hit are youth under age 24. Drug deaths in people under the age of 24 are up 50%. The crazy thing is that the under 24 set is the set that's on, th those people are on Snapchat. And one of the things that's happening is parents of, of children who have died from fentanyl, either overdoses of fentanyl or by being poisoned by a fentanyl laced pill are starting to screenshot the snaps of kids being marketed those drugs on Snapchat. So here's how I would categorize it. There's an opioid crisis in this country. If anyone's watched Dope Sick, you can see the, the whole story of uh, Purdue Pharma and what happened when every doctor in America started to prescribe pain pills. That whole crisis has brought on a new crisis, which is essentially that pills, anyone can be a drug dealer. Pills can be manufactured anywhere, created by anyone, Fentanyl is so potent that a brick of fentanyl can kill, I don't know how many people, but a massive, massive, massive quantity of people. Every drug you take now is a game of Russian roulette. Like if you don't know where a drug comes from, whether it's a Xanax, a Percocet, an Adderall, a Ritalin, like if you don't know who's making the drug that you, that you take from a friend, don't take drugs from friends. Actually, let's just stop it there. Don't take drugs from friends. If you don't know what where your drug comes from, there is a high chance that that drug could be laced with something that could kill you. Because at this point in time, drug creation and drug dealing has been completely democratized. And like everything else, it is completely marketable and invisibly marketable on social media. Okay, all birds. We love all birds. All birds are all natural. They've got shoes made from eucalyptus. eucalyptus. I wish my shoes would smell like eucalyptus. That's a tough word to say, eucalyptus. 
Say it three times fast. Eucalyptus, eucalyptus, eucalyptus. Ooh, I did it. <laughs> okay, anyways, they have this sneaker called the Tree Flyer sneaker, which is amazing. The Tree Flyer is light in weight and has low carbon footprint. Huge cushion, big energy return, super comfortable. They're washable. I wear them at home. Again, they don't smell like eucalyptus. But what's amazing about the Tree Flyer is that they've got great grip, so you feel like you're running and you have traction on the ground, and yet they're very, very comfortable, and they're all natural. So why wouldn't you want some? If you go to allbirds.com, that's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S.com, you can get a tree flyer and start running today. So Tiffany Robertson, I don't know if anyone who listens to this show or watches this show watched American Idol, but Tiffany was a finalist on American Idol. She took a Percocet from a friend because she was in pain and she died from taking that Percocet. Her mom, Virginia, has found a way to create a foundation and has really dedicated the rest of her life to talking about people who are poison, poisoned by fake pills and who are poisoned by fentanyl. So she has an organization called the Lost Voices of Fentanyl. And I'm really happy that she's here to talk to us about her story. Literally, I want to give the floor to you. So however, whatever you want to talk about, however you want to talk about it, like we're all ears. As everyone is aware, back in 2008 going forward, in fact, it could even go back as far as the 1990s, um, Purdue Pharmaceuticals uh, began flooding the United States with prescription grade opiates and, and which resulted in more than 10 million um, opioid addictions. That is the old drug crisis. Um, so when we deem old and new, I'll explain the difference. So in the old drug crisis, someone would get a substance, be it prescription or otherwise, they would know what they were getting. Um, they would get exactly what they intended to consume. They would use it a while, they would get addicted, and they would have 20 to 30 years of opportunities to get clean or die essentially. Um, and that, that applies to most opioids. In the new crisis, in this fentanyl crisis, which began in 2013, people who don't know that they're getting illicit fentanyl, they uh, are consuming it without their knowledge or intent. And they don't have 10 to 20 years to get cleaner or die. They're dying. Mm -hmm. um, some of them within roughly, if they continue to use it, roughly about a year. So all those years of opportunities are being stolen for them to get better. But what makes it even worse is that this has moved outside of the substance use disorder community and it's impacting regular everyday people. Um, particularly now we're seeing a huge increase in teens and young people who are getting a hold of these fake prescription pills, which do not, they're not laced pills. And I hear that term used a lot, that's inaccurate. They do not contain any of the drug they advertise. They are simply made up of pure illicit fentanyl and pill binding powders. And they're being pumped out in labs, um, massive labs in Mexico. And also uh, now we have some homegrown labs that are springing up right here in the United States. Um, to explain a little bit about fentanyl, how cheap it is. It's, you know, in terms of the production of fentanyl, the distribution of fentanyl, and also mm -hmm. why the illegal drug market or dealers are cutting everything with fentanyl. Explain that a little bit. So when we're talking about fentanyl, uh, it's 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Now we make our own prescription grade fentanyl, which we use mostly in hospice and stage cancer treatment. We make that right here um, under heavily controlled conditions. We do not import it. The big attraction with fentanyl is that the dosage is so small. Um, it's, it's dosed out in micrograms. So two grains the size of, it's not really the consistency of salt, but it's a good uh, measurement for people to see it. Uh, two grains um, the size of a salt grain is enough to kill a person. And um, now if you're opioid tolerant, it might take a little more, but for an average person who's never encountered this kind of stuff before, that is enough to take a life. Um, it's attractive to the cartels for two reasons. First of all, it creates a much stronger and faster addiction, um, and it's also extremely portable. So if they wanted to transport or smuggle, um, let's say, uh, 100 pounds of heroin into the country, they can do that now with one small brick 
of fentanyl, which is much easier to disguise. It's easier to smuggle. They don't have to grow a poppy field. Um, they don't have to worry about harvesting it. They don't have to worry about weather. All the advantages from a business perspective that um, one would be able to obtain uh, by using this as a product or and replacing all of the old opiate markets, illicit opiate market with it, is ex extremely advantageous. The other thing the cartels identified is that America is a pill popping nation, and we are. Um, we pharmaceutical companies direct market to people all day, every day, telling them how a pill can fix everything from depression all the way up to whatever you may have. Just try this pill, take this medicine, it'll fix it. They saw that market. So under pressure from the Trump administration in 2019, China agreed just to ban fentanyl manufacturing in their country, which is, sounds great on the surface. But what really happened was they didn't include language that banned the 4ANPP precursor chemical that is used to make fentanyl. So what did China do? They simply started mass producing the 4 PP. They brought over cartel chemists and trained them in a one pot method to complete the process. And now they mass ship the 4 PP directly to Mexico and put this deadly substance in the hands of the greatest drug traffickers on the planet. So Virginia, talk a little bit about Tiffany, like give, give some context of your personal story and what's really motivated you to take on this cause and to raise awareness. Like, I think what you're doing is so incredible and such a tribute, but give people some perspective of how you got here. You know, I had a, a, a beautiful family and I use the term had because that doesn't exist anymore. Um, in 2015, my daughter she went over to help a friend in need. Well, not even really a friend. It was a stranger in need. Um, and she fell through a dilapidated porch while bringing over some baby clothes to them. And she herniated three lumbar discs. This was in the middle of the opioid crisis, we'll call it, with Purdue. So as a reaction, many healthcare providers were extremely reluctant to prescribe narcotic medications, even in the most severe cases. And my daughter was one of those cases. So she went to the hospital. She was seen in the emergency room. She went to her doctor. They referred her to a neurosurgeon, but none of those people wanted to give her anything for her pain. And, you know, she had two small children at home and she was struggling. So what happened with her is something that happens every single day in this country. A friend of a friend saw her in pain, knew she was suffering and said, hey, I have an extra Percocet. You can have it. And that was one of the fake pills and it claimed her life. I thought about a lot of things. And let me tell you the journey of that kind of grief is nothing I would wish on my worst enemy um, because you don't just lose your child, you lose yourself. And every who you were before that loss is gone and you become a whole, you have to figure out who are you? What is my new normal in this world without my child? But then I thought about all the parents out there who are going through the same thing. And how common it is for us to see someone out there, oh, you know, do you have a Tylenol? Do you have, you know, an Advil? We do it all the time. And we don't do it because we're nefarious or we're bad people. We do it because we care. And yeah. so our empathy is actually contributing to the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and now we have big tech, which has really changed the face of, of how drug trafficking occurs. Anybody with a smartphone, uh, can pick it up, go to Snapchat or Instagram. And if you know the right word, you'll be able to buy these pills and other products that contain fentanyl online. And that's children as young as 12. And it's not even a tricky word. It's like pain no. pill. So yeah. talk a little bit more, because I've been reading a lot about this. Like your story's heartbreaking. The opioid crisis is heartbreaking in general. It is. This crisis is the magnitude of it, though, is just so severe. Your daughter was in pain. Somebody mm -hmm. has a headache, right? Yeah. Like, hey, oh, I have an ad. I mean, how many people have you offered a, a pill to? Like, I've offered a pill to hundreds of people. Somebody has a headache. Somebody has cramps. Somebody isn't feeling good. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the, that it's without consent, it's without intent. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the, it's without knowing. So the other piece that I think is really interesting that you touched on is this is a pill popping country. This is a country mm -hmm. that is looking for 
the next best thing. You want to be younger, skinnier, happier, healthier, better hair, better skin, better body. That that's how an American consumer is raised and conditioned. Right. How talk a little bit more about what you see happening on Instagram and Amazon or Snapchat, whether it's a social network or a commerce platform. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, what's really interesting, <clears throat> and I just did this and, and we're going to do this on here on the show today. I um, one of the things I noticed is that we have a lot of companies out there, um, particularly uh, big tech, who is um, who is contributing to this. For instance, Snapchat has the perfect criminal model. Um, you go there, you put something up there, you make a post, and it vanishes without a footprint within hours of it being up there. So we have a lot of parents, uh, particularly in California, who are pushing back against Snapchat because. Uh, their kids, they have evidence on their phone that their children got these pills right from Snapchat. And what's really scary is they don't have to go to a back alley somewhere and find some scary looking guy, you know, to get any of these things. They order them right online and they deliver like pizza. So many of these young people had these things delivered right to their homes. Their parents had no idea. And so now we have Drug tracker, traffickers today have the ability to be within your own living room. And that is something we've never had before. The other problem we have is, as I mentioned earlier, we have um, an entire generation who, and, and this has been going on for years, who do believe that, you know, if I just take this one pill, I'm going to feel better, or this is going to get fixed, or that's going to be resolved. And so what we haven't done is we haven't taught people how to cope with problems like this. What we do is we try to figure out ways to fix them and we all want it quick, we want it now, we wanna fix it fast. Um, then we have those contributing to this like Amazon and YouTube, and those are two great examples and Google as well. Um, those fake, the, the, the pill dyes, which are trademark products being made by pharmaceutical companies are being sold mainly by Chinese companies right on Google. I can look up Xanax dye and I will be able to buy a pill press. I can buy the dyes that are stamped with, that look identical to the trademark products. And I can buy other things to make these pills like the pill binding powders. In order to make a pill, someone has to have first whatever drug it is they intend to be in it. And they need pill binding powders, which are also called excipients. If you don't have the binding powders, you can't make the pill. So I was able to go onto Amazon and I have the package and I'm going to open it up for you all right oh, yeah, now. Okay. Here we go. This came right from Amazon Prime. I ordered it yesterday. It was delivered overnight to my house. And I'm going to open it right here for everyone to see what I got. The Xanax colored Permapress pill binding powders to make fake Xanax. Those were delivered right to my house with no questions asked. And they're the exact same color as the trademark blue um, products. And this is what's going on. Now I've written to Amazon, I can't tell you how many times about these things being sold on their platform. And so far it's been to no avail. They have not responded to anything. And so I'm hoping that maybe, you know, by showing people just how easy it was for me to get this, without any license, without any, any business um, affiliation to uh, the pharmaceutical aid, you know, uh, industry, that maybe we can change it. But this is one kilogram of baby blue pill binding powder. You can also go, this same company, LFA, sells the commercial pill presses to anybody who wants to buy one. So you can go online, you can order that pill press, and then to make it worse, you can go to YouTube, and there are hundreds of videos telling you how to press the perfect pill. They give people the exact directions on how to do this. And these are ramping up these fake pill operations that are springing up everywhere. It sounds um, like anyone can have a fake pill operation. Like anybody it's could. Complete, it's the complete democratization of uh, drug manufacturing, right? Yeah. Like you can, you can manufacture drugs in your own home now. Exactly. And, and they're finding these labs. In fact, they just busted one uh, in Michigan two hours ago. And this goes on all day, every day. And these folks are able to get this powdered illicit fentanyl right from the distributors just across the border. And they're able to get it in here so easily. 
it's it's really frightening. Um, and the problem is that there are two terms that one term that most of our families are really offended by, and that's when someone calls what happened to our children an overdose. Our children did not overdose, they were poisoned. And let me explain the distinction. Um, my daughter did not go out and, and look for any kind of an illicit drug. She was given a pill that was very deliberately made to mimic a trademark pharmaceutical product. Now, I don't condone that she got a pill outside of the, the traditional means, but that doesn't change the fact that someone very deliberately made that pill to look like a Percocet and put it out on the market full well knowing that it contained nothing but fentanyl. And that's happening over and over and over. The same thing is true of any contaminated drug. Um, so when we're talking about an overdose, again, a person knows what they're getting, they intend to consume what they've gotten, and they get exactly what they ask for, and they simply take too much. And 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 we're not saying that they do that on purpose, it just happens. Yes, it's it's it. an accident. Um, but when we're talking about poisoning, when anyone disguises a harmful substance as something else or puts it into anything for another person to consume, that is a poisoning by its very definition. So, and, and, and knowledge and intent are the two factors that really define the difference between the two. Yep. Are there still overdoses? Absolutely, there are. Um, are there now, are we seeing a more cases of poisonings? Yes, we are. <clears throat> and this is true of anyone who's, you know, they're looking to get cocaine for a party on Friday night and they're getting fentanyl in that cocaine and they're dying. You know, they assume the risk of, of, of taking cocaine. They assume the risk of taking these pills, what they didn't intend or assume the risk to take fentanyl. Yeah. And so we have a lot of parents who are finally speaking up and saying, labeling our losses. You know, nobody gets to assign what happened to our children. We know better than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, parents of children with substance use disorder, they know what their child's drug of choice is. They, they, they've been fighting to save their lives. And so when someone miscategorizes it, it's not only um, is an insult to the family, but it also stops us from coming to real working solutions that are going to solve the problem. Yeah, it masks the problem. The, exactly. The, the addiction is a problem. Yes. Depression a is a one. problem. Addiction is a problem. Illicit drugs are a problem. Yes. But what you're describing is something else entirely, which exactly. is- Exactly. And, and we have 13.2 thousand families in our group. We're growing at a rate of 200 new families a week. And it's because all of them are- are, are in this same category and it's being masked. And, and it, the solutions to solve a, an addiction issue, the, the, the way you would help someone with substance use disorder or to prevent an overdose are entirely different than what you yeah. do to address the criminal problem of poisonings. Right. And as long as we don't, you know, so what, we're not asking it for it to be one way or the other. What we're saying is we need a balanced approach that adopts a whole of society initiative so that we are looking at all of these cases on and, and really looking at and determining how they should be categorized mm -hmm. and and then giving the the proper solutions and and so far this side of the aisle hasn't been addressed at all yep um and virginia talk a little bit about your organization and how people can support you or get involved or you know how do people help your cause or how do people also refer families who may be struggling or the victim of something like this? Like talk a little bit about how people get involved with you. Uh, well, um, we have merged our two organizations. I started a foundation, Parents Against Illicit Narcotics. You can find that online. Um, it's www.p-a-i-n.us. But our, our, our organization is specific to fentanyl um, is Lost Voices of Fentanyl. You can find us on Facebook. Um, I am right now in the process of finalizing the website. So we will have a website very soon. Um, and uh, we are a, both of our organizations are nonprofit organizations. Um, we're taking donations both through our pain website and you can come find us on Facebook. And also uh, we accept donations there as well. Our families just want to get this take, we want this off the street. We want, we need support from everyone to understand what these deaths really are. And, and we, we're asking all of our leadership to take measures to, you know, 
recognize and start to address this side of the problem because it's it's largely been ignored up to now. Okay, so we'll take a quick break. Thank you to Uncommon James for sponsoring Token CEO. So Uncommon James, which is Kristen Cavallari's company, has a new beauty line called Uncommon Beauty. You've seen me, I use the lipstick, chapstick, lip balm, I think they call it. It's amazing, like I just smear it and smudge it all over everything. The goal of Uncommon Beauty is to shrink your beauty routine. So you used to have 700 products and 15 lip balms. Now you only need one. It travels nicely and neatly. It's well packaged. It smells great. It tastes great. I hate when you use lip balm and it doesn't taste good or it tastes a lot. And you're just like, oh my God, I'm like, like banana boat. No, sun bum. Sun bum chapstick makes your lips a sting and then you just taste the fake banana for an inordinate amount of time. Uncommon Beauty isn't like that. So it's clean, it's fresh, it looks great and it doesn't taste like anything. They have a hydrating moisturizer, they've got eye cream, lip balm, they've got a pineapple peptide nectar, which is a hydrating serum with vitamin C. If you want to see the difference that clean skincare can make, use code TOKEN10 for, at checkout for 10% off your Uncommon Beauty or your Uncommon James order. All right, let's hand it over to Q&A. First question, how should I go about getting a counter offer from my current employer if I have a new job offer? I'd love to know the badass way to handle this. Ooh, I don't know if there's a badass way to handle this. This is a tough one because I think one of the things that happens is when your current employer finds out that you've been interviewing for a job and want to go elsewhere, some part of their brain is like, okay, fuck you, why don't you go leave? So as nice as your manager or your boss is, that current of thought is running through their brain. The way I would go about it is to do this. I would say, hey, I got approached by a company. Um, I wasn't looking. My intention wasn't to go find a new job. I love what I do here. I really believe in this company. But so-and-so called with a proposition that I couldn't refuse. Here's what I really like about what they're doing. The job would have more responsibility. I would get to be able to take on this, that, and the other thing. Don't just talk about title and money, right? Your boss doesn't want to hear about that. They want to hear why you're excited about this other offer. And when you describe why you're excited about the other offer, what you're really reiterating for your boss is why you're great at your current job and what more you could do at that company. Then you say, hey, I wasn't gonna take it seriously, but they showed up with this package that included ABC, XYZ, one, two, three. It included all this stuff you want. And it's made you really seriously consider, um, it's made you really consider a job or an employment opportunity at this other company. Now, before you do that, Know that if you go into this conversation, you risk your boss being like, okay, go take the offer. So don't have the conversation if you are not prepared to take the offer or if you don't actually want to leave. If you don't want to leave, you got to frame the conversation a little bit differently. If you're indifferent, then you probably want to take the job with more money. And if you're trying to persuade your current company to keep you, but at a higher price, I think you just got to handle the conversation with a little bit of delicacy. So I think saying, hey, this fell into my lap. I don't really want to take it. I'm, I'm not going to take the offer, but I would love to understand what my path is here, or what, where you think I have the opportunity to make more money. So I guess in short, there's no real badass way to do it. The badass thing to do is to be like, fuck you motherfuckers, I got a better offer, see you later, right? But it doesn't sound like you want that. So I think you really have to understand why are you looking for a counter offer? Do you not in fact want to leave? Do you just wanna make more money or have a better title or have more responsibility where you are? Or do you want to juice or jack up the offer that you've just received and use your company to do that? So figure out your, your motivation and drive your strategy from there. And I think that's the badass thing to do. The other badass thing to do is to understand the risk you have in having this conversation and to be sure you're comfortable with it and to navigate the conversation accordingly. All right, second question. How long is too long to wait to hear back from a last round interview? I interviewed with a large biotech company in my area almost four weeks ago and sent a follow-up email after two weeks when the HR woman responded with, hope to get back to you with a decision ASAP. What should I do next? Okay, 
The first thing I think you should do is to understand that you are not the front runner for this job. So there is somebody else they are trying to hire and it is not you. So A, just keep that in mind. I think B, if you really want this job, I would follow up with the HR person again and say, hey, I'm just checking back in. I'd like to make a decision about my next step. So I would appreciate an answer, you know, soonest or, you know, give a deadline, say, I'd really appreciate an answer by the end of this week. Um, the C, C, the third thing I think you should do is to not plan on getting this job and that you've got to either make where you are work or go pursue other job opportunities. The last thing I would say is that, like, I'm guilty of this too, is when you're doing a thousand things during your day, it's hard to like keep pace with all the candidates and to follow up consistently. Like we're really bad at that, I would say. Um, but that said, having a month almost go by, that means that the role doesn't exist anymore. Or there's some challenge or there's something not going totally right or the company just isn't really highly communicative or highly organized. Like, again, we've been guilty. I've personally been guilty of all of this, but you gotta keep that in mind. I think if you were a top, top, top candidate and this company felt you were a perfect fit, you wouldn't be waiting a month to hear from them. So just acknowledge that and figure out how bad you either want that job or take the next step to get the job you do want. Question number three, I feel like a lot of the time I provide feedback it can be negatively construed no matter how nicely I say it. Any tips for how to give feedback? Okay, the first thing is I would smile. Like, smile, be pleasant, don't be abrasive, don't call people stupid, don't make them feel stupid. Like, you know when you're making people feel stupid. Like, if you want to take feedback nicely, I would say a couple things, which is one, smile to start with the positive and not the fake positive, like actually start with something meaningfully positive. And three, be, be positive even in your negative feedback, right? Like you could be like, hey, I love the way you do this, um, but I'm really struggling with how this is happening. And I would love to see you address this by thinking about A, B, or C. So try to be positive, even though the feedback is negative, and then repeat the positive thing that you said at the beginning. So it's kind of like a sandwich. Say something positive, put the negative stuff in there as positively as possible, and then follow up with the positive. That is probably the most surefire way to make sure your feedback is heard in a way that's positive. Um, the other thing is don't forget, don't forget your demeanor and body language, but you gotta keep in mind, I think, that your body language makes a big difference and how you approach something, regardless of what you say, can have a major impact on it. All right, that's it for today's episode. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can buy the merch at store.barstool.com. You can follow us on most any social media platform out there. If you want a job at Barstool Sports, you can check them out at LinkedIn. You can be part of our mentorship group on Facebook. And there's a whole bunch of new jobs that work like a girl. So we'll see you back here next week.